Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. This is uh, Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Areas Center, and we're really pleased today to welcome James Hardcastle and Sue Wells, who are going to be speaking about the IUCN Green List on protected areas, and particularly how it relates to marine protected areas. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to thank our co-hosts, Open Channels and EBM Tools, who are uh, delivering with us this monthly webinar series on marine protected areas. So we do this on the second Thursday of every month in this time slot. Um, and what we're going to do is present for about a half an hour or maybe a little longer, and then uh, we will be able to facilitate a Q&A session. So we encourage you to please go ahead and type in any questions or comments that you have into the question box on the webinar interface, and we will get to those uh, when the presenters have done their overview. So. Uh, well, I will go ahead and introduce our speakers today. James Hardcastle is the Program Development Manager uh, at the Protected Areas Program of IUCN, and he helps to ensure that programs are well-designed and resourced to achieve lasting results and has a diverse background in protected areas, community-based conservation, and climate change adaptation. And he has worked in many different countries and has a particular expertise in participatory planning tools and sustainable financing for conservation. And Sue Wells is currently a private consultant, and uh, she has worked on MPAs for over 25 years in a variety of ways with the World Conservation Monitoring Center in Cambridge, with World Wildlife Fund International, and the IUCN Eastern Africa Regional Program, and also at the National Program in Belize and countries in the Western Indian Ocean and the UK. And with uh, the World Commission on Protected Areas Marine, she helped to produce the MPA guidelines on IUCN protected area management categories, which led to her current interest in the green list and how it might apply to MPAs. So I will turn it over to Sue, who is going to get us started. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Lauren, um, and welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is, is great because this whole very exciting new initiative that IUCN has started and that James will explain in more detail in a moment. I'm just going to start by introducing the, the general topic of the Green List. I, I'm not an expert, and I expect we have some people uh, in the audience who, who've probably been involved more than me, but I, I got very interested um, having been involved with some of the um, assessments of management effectiveness um, that uh, IUCN initi initiated, and um, we ran a program in the Western Indian Ocean, and I have a very sort of strong uh, personal feeling about the importance of um, getting MPAs managed effectively and actually meeting their conservation objectives. And so I just wanted to sort of make the point about the Green List because uh, uh, we'll, we'll hear more about it. But um, the important thing to understand about it is, is that uh, although you sort of end up with what might seem like a kind of award of being a Green Listed Protected Areas, the, the aim of it really is to help protected areas, um, as it says on this slide, deliver their conservation impacts. It's, it's an ongoing um, process that, that uh, you can take part in that will help you uh, and will help marine protected area managers actually achieve what they've set out to do. Um, so, and of course for marine protected areas, it's, it's, this is particularly important, I think. Um, some of us get rather tied up in trying to meet targets for areas actually protected. And we must remember that um, effective management and meeting the objectives are just as important. Um, James, sorry, can you move on to the next slide? Sorry if there's a delay, but anyway, the, the next slide when it comes up will um, summarize the main principles of the green list. Um, is it going to come? <laughs> James, are you there? It's showing up for okay, us. It should great. be live. Fine. I, maybe the, I might have a longer delay. I was afraid I'm speaking from Mauritius, so, which is very nice, but uh, has slow. that's great. So um, the main um, key points that we need to bear in mind with the green list is it's, it's a global standard. Um, it applies throughout the world to all countries, um, but it, it's adaptable. Um, people get concerned that they might not be able to sort of meet some kind of global standard, but actually, as you'll discover, it's adaptable to um, local situations and any particular country or region. 
The other thing to remember, it's voluntary, a voluntary commitment. Um, once you start to take part in it, obviously, you know, the IUCN will like you to keep going, but it is voluntary, so um, there's no sort of pressure on anyone that they have to do this. And as I mentioned before, the, the main purpose of it is to help people improve the, the performance of marine protected areas. What's perhaps different from other initiatives that have been launched before is that um, because the process involves uh, independent, an independently assured evaluation or certification process, uh, it's very credible. You can sort of go back and actually see why um, an MPA or protected area has achieved green list status. So it's it's very transparent and you can see with sort of straightforward, very clear um, criteria and um, a process that has to be gone through. And of course the very nice thing about it is that um, for protected areas that, that get to be on the green list it is very nice global recognition of what's been achieved um, and particularly for what the staff have achieved. Move on to the next one James. It's, very slow it's up for me. It's up, is it? Okay, thank you. Uh, um, and as James will explain, IUCN has initi initiated it, um, and there are a series of steps and activities that that um, are need to be gone through. Um, we the way it works is through a national or I think. Well, James will explain in more detail because I think there are they're not necessary national, um, just nat national expert action groups, James. But you can explain that in more detail. Um, the the process is measuring the performance of the MPA against the standard um, once this has been tailored to the local context, and we've got now some nice examples of how this is being done, which I think James will be running through. Um, there's a sort of process there you can actually promote through IUCN, you're able to promote the success of the work that's being done. And the other very important aspect of it, of course, going through a process like this, it helps you to identify the gaps uh, in investment, uh, in financial investment, uh, capacity building and other issues that you might need to actually build uh, the sustainability of the protected area system and, and in this case uh, marine protected areas. And uh, as we've mentioned before, it's, it provides this nice reward and recognition for the actual people who uh, are involved in MPA. So we're, we're concerned about the biodiversity and the achievement of pr the protection of that, but um, the people who are doing this also need to be recognised. Okay, James. So we then want to um, just run through why we sort of specifically talking about the green list in the context of MPAs. The green list is it's very important to understand it is designed for all types of protected areas from mountain tops to deep sea oceans. It's it's very broad. Um, when you get to look at the um, initially look at the standards you'll see it's, ve it's, it's very broad. Um, so it can apply to anything. Um, but we want to be sure for marine protected areas that um, the guidelines for um, actually participating in the process are clear. A number of questions have already come up since the launch of the Green List program uh, about the involvement of uh, inclusion of MPAs in this. And so um, by initiating this discussion with the MPA community, will be able to identify any any problems and issues. Um, secondly, the, um, the this whole topic was identified in fact by WCPA Marine back as, as long ago as 20, 2008 um, when it was suggested that some kind of certification scheme for MPAs would be useful. Um, since then, uh, the Green List has come out of the, glo of the global program at IUCN and we want to make sure that we're linked firmly in with that. And thirdly, the, there are a number of other initiatives and some of you in the audience may have been involved in these at regional or global level that are doing this kind of work and we want to make sure that um, we're well connected up with these and understand how we can complement each other's work. Okay. Um, oh, am I handing over to you now, James, or did you, is there one more you want me to talk to? 
Sorry, I've temporarily lost. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry, I lost my control yeah. panel, so I just had to jump out. But it should be coming up now. Just the next slide, slide Sue, if you could talk to the Marine uh, Working Group. And then I'll oh, take right. It. Okay, yeah. that's the next one. Apologies to everyone for the slightly disjointed presentation. So, yes, following on from why Marine, there was clearly some reasons to look at Marine protected areas in the context of the Green List. And what we've done through WCPA Marine, we've set up a small working group. It's a small group of people who have already been involved in the process through the pilot phase that James will explain to you, um, with a few other people who are involved in other ways in similar um, initiatives and we are going to carry out a number of activities um, over the next couple of years to really promote the green list for marine protected areas uh, to, develop, to develop any guidance that um, uh, might be needed, any additional guidance that might be needed and most importantly to get the experience of um, those who've participated in the program so far. There will be, have been a number of MPAs that have already gone through the process and we want to get their views on this. Um, I think it's best to hand over to you now, James. I don't have the... I can no longer see the screen. Have, is it up for everybody else? Yeah, it's up for us. Okay, good. So thanks a lot, Sue. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, introduction just to some of the, the overall points and I, I'm really keen for Sue to jump in to make sure this stays on the marine topic because the, the IUCN Greenlist of Protected Areas is of course designed to be uh, applicable to any type of protected area, terrestrial, freshwater, subterranean and of course marine and the various other places we might think of as well. So it's uh, any size, any shape, uh, any governance type, um, we're hoping that this can be a useful a useful tool. Um, also just to point out that uh, we've gone through one pilot phase um, and rather than try and develop everything in um, you know in, in theory and kind of working out what we could best do we just really did it quite incrementally in the pilot phase. We started with a couple of countries, we added a couple more, we made it up as we went along, uh, we kept on going but you know at a certain point we said we, we can't test this without doing it live without actually having protected areas put their hands up, uh, the agencies supporting them put their hands up and uh, e experts within those jurisdictions to also put their hands up to help us put it together. So we had a really good collaboration um, and we're now, uh, just next month, we've had a, a bit of a hiatus, just an evaluation feedback from that first phase. We're now just uh, next month launching uh, a development phase we're calling it which will take us through the next three years uh, where we can um, really get to grips with um, with the green list and how it can be applied, uh, what the what the value is to people, how we can you know get the costs balanced, how we can get all these different bits uh, bits together. So all of you on here, you're welcome. Uh, please pitch in with ideas, comments, um, and and get involved. This is something that's not uh, being developed in isolation, and then will be just 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 put out there. So we'll, here on this slide are the the key steps. Essentially, this is the green list uh, process, and it starts uh, with that collaboration with IUCN that Sue mentioned. So an interested jurisdiction, and we're, we're not limiting that to countries, although generally at the moment it tends to be countries, but it could be a state within a country, it could be uh, a, a region. So for example, we're hoping to work with the Micronesia uh, region in the North Pacific, which is three countries and two US territories. So that would be one jurisdiction. You know, in the future we could see maybe a, you know, a Central America or an Amazonia. There's different ways to, to, to dice things up that make sense. And of course with the marine uh, realm with the marine protected areas then there might be some uh, jurisdictions that would be more relevant to the marine context and, and could possibly form their own their own group but once that is set up the first point there is to an, uh, is to have our independent uh, reviewer so we have this uh, assurance model so that independent reviewer is appointed from the start so we have uh, kind of auditing as we go of the process and how things are conducted um, the key, the second point I'll speak to is this expert action group. They're the people who know the country, know the place, know the protected areas, know different types of uh, skills behind protected areas, and they're the ones that are really the engine uh, in this process. Um, Sue mentioned the standard. It will be a global standard, and I'll come on to how that can be adapted uh, to the local context. And then even within a jurisdiction, you might have specific adaptations that are possible for marine protected areas, let's say. 
Um, once we've got all through 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 the kind of the startup, then it's about you know go forth and get protected areas interested. They sign up, they register their interest, we mentor them, they become candidates, and once they're a candidate, they really push to get that full you know to meet the standard um, and to be uh, verified um, and recognised as being you know IUC and green list. Um, and off they go. So that's the summary. You think I'm finished? That I'm not. That's just the summary. So I'll go through some of the points here. Uh, so I mentioned the expert action group. This is the team who make the IUCN green list happen. It's a balance of expertise in a group that provides the critical objectivity and the expert judgment. They are the, the group that evaluate the protected area against the standard. We're offering, uh, we're developing different um, materials, uh, training. Uh, the members of this group, again, it will be voluntary. We, we want to link it to being members of the World Commission on Protected Areas. And I see very much, uh, um, you know, it's not exclusively, you don't have to be a member of WCPA, but you do need to be an expert in your country. And, and this, is, this is, for me, one of the key focus of the Green List is to provide a, a hub, to provide a, a platform, to build on existing networks of experts in protected areas, marine protected areas, who are really interested to, to use that expertise and to contribute beyond whichever uh, day job that they might have. So supporting this group is a critical part of it, which will then lead to you know good evaluation of the protected areas against the standard, but also encourage more uh, connection to protected areas within each jurisdiction. Um, so they also provide you know, kind of the motivation and support for the managers and the staff, um, and help us you know recognise the success stories. And you know, so they're really the engine within the, within the each jurisdiction. So I'll move to the next slide. You might have a lag. Um, I'm just going to, just quickly, I, there's, there's a few bullets on there. You can look at this at your leisure. This, this PowerPoint will be shared. Um, but we establish that expert group once we agree with a jurisdiction that we're going to work there. So, for example, uh, Mexico is one country that we're just uh, starting to collaborate with, and we're in the process of um, you know, canvassing who would be interested, what the, kind of the, the skills and backgrounds we might need, developing terms of reference, finding our independent reviewer and getting them accredited and assigned. Um, and then the role of the, the protected area agency in that example is CONAMP in Mexico. Um, they're hosting, they're a partner, they're supporting this um, and you know helping it to really happen. So then we'd get into the process. Uh, so this expert group would look at the standard, they would adapt it to the context, which I'll come on to. You know, it's their role to promote the greenness in the country. It doesn't mean it's an IUCN uh, in Colombia, for example, it's WWF or our lead agency. They're the, they're the ones doing all the moving and shaking on the ground. Uh, in China, we're working with several groups, uh, Conservation International, for example, and then obviously a lot of local partners. Um, so really, it's about promoting through the different channels and networks, promoting the green list, helping select the protected areas that are interested, getting them registered, uh, getting them up to, to be candidates, and then evaluating the full nominations. Um, and then the recurrent task then would be to submit those evaluations to IUCN via our, our review process. Um, and then to you know promote the successful protected areas, um, help those that aren't quite meeting the standard to identify what gaps there might be, and so on and so forth. So kind of the recurrent process there. So again, this action expert action group, that's uh, that's the engine of the greenest in in each of our jurisdictions. So I I couldn't find a picture of a fish eagle, but there's a there's kind of a reviewer there, kind of the watching eye, uh, which would be appointed. Uh, by IUCN to each of these groups, uh, they review the process. They do not provide uh, technical input. They do not decide whether the protected area has, you know, more rhino population than it did last week. They don't. They don't judge about some of the, you know, the the, the more technical aspects. But what they do is uh, they will go through the the process and make it every single stage that things are done properly and done according to the assurance procedure that we have. The reviewers are accredited by a third party. In this case, we're working with Accreditation Services International, who also do this uh, this role for the Marine Stewardship Council, Forest Stewardship Council, and a host of others. So they have, um, as part of their uh, mission, they're they're really helping us develop in partnership, develop this uh, uh, the green list. So that's been a really useful uh, collaboration to have. Um, the reviewers are culturally and linguistically in tune. We have a model by which we can have a regional professional auditor, but then we have associates based in each country or each jurisdiction so they can understand the language, they know the culture, they know, you know how things work and how meetings are done and so on. So they can be really in tune. And they can assure all aspects of the green list. So this it might add, it adds complexity and we're trying to balance you know, the, the how much complexity against how much freedom. 
but essentially we must ensure that uh, any protected area that uh, achieves the green list can be uh, assured that they have done that on merit and there hasn't been some uh, promotion or, or you know, way to get around the process. So then we get to the actual standard and I have the slides at the back of this I've listed out just a summary of the main criteria but I don't want to present everything now because it would take take a while and uh, probably probably detract but essentially it's very simple we have uh, four pillars well kind of three pillars and a and a, and a whale's tail here um, you know if I was talking to the forest here it would be a tree but I found a whale and that, that kind of works for me so we have the three pillars underneath which are that the protected area, marine protected area, is designed to deliver uh, the conservation of its key, uh, key values. So it's, it's designed, you know, it's, it's big enough, it's large enough, it, it knows what its values are and its, its design is able to deliver those. The central pillar of our green list is the governance and that the, the governance arrangements for the protected area are equitable and this comes again from the the CBD language on the strategic plan 2011 to 2020 and IHE target 11, the, the quality elements of this really fit into our, our standards. So the equitable governance is really important, central pillar. And then those two also you know, combine with the effective management as Sue mentioned before and there's a lot of work being done on, on marine protected areas and effective management. Um, less so on governance but they really, th this, is, this is the nuts and bolts of it. And this then leads to the fundamental piece of the greenness. What we're really looking at is is the conservation outcomes. And it, it, are the three pillars, is the protected area, are all the processes in place to deliver conservation impact? And the real job of the expert reference group is to look at that particular component. A lot of the, the inputs to the, the, the bottom three pillars, the criteria, is could be self-assessment, it's based on different reports and inputs, but it's that critical pieces Yes, it's designed well. Yes, it looks like it has good governance processes. Yes, it's got a management plan. But is it actually uh, conserving the natural and social values that are, you know, the area represents, and is it having a conservation impact? So that's the critical piece. And I, I hope there'll be a few questions, such as how do you measure that, and how many protected areas in the world are actually doing that. Um, and uh, the response to that would be, well, let's start with this and see how many we can we can start getting on track to do that. So that's the pillars, and there are. Um, the slide is just changing. So that's the global standard and then we're developing a mechanism by which it can be adapted to a local context. And I think it's important for the marine protected area context that we really look at this and uh, we come up with either elements of the criteria globally but also uh, some guidance on how and when some of these would be more applicable to marine protected areas or not. So essentially we have uh, those four pillars uh, on the left and they're global. The criteria are globally consistent. We don't change the criteria. There could be a case where a jurisdiction would say a criteria is not relevant, but uh, normally there might be more criteria added. But as, if we can have those 20 globally consistent, what you can do at the country level is the indicators. Uh, so how do those criteria then break down into indicators and then the means of verification that would uh, uh, you know, provide the evidence uh, that those indicators are being met. So that is what happens at the local local level. It doesn't mean you have to change everything. We, we have a generic set of indicators. Uh, but um, the first job with the jurisdiction when they're setting this up is to, uh, to make those changes. And, and that can be revised periodically as well. And that's uh, negotiated with IUCN. And when IUCN is happy that uh, those uh, criteria are suitable for that, that jurisdiction, that context, then that's what we, we set, that's what we agree, and that's what we move on. So I hope that's clear. So we have globally consistent criteria that must be met, but the indicators and the means of verification and some additional and possibly some uh, not relevant uh, criteria can also be changed at the local level. So I'm just uh, changing the slide. There's three steps we've identified. In the pilot phase, we just had two. We didn't have this candidacy uh, patient. Sorry, I, I slipped again. Uh, we had two steps in the pilot phase. You registered for the green list, and then you tried to achieve the full standard. And what we found was some protected areas were in the middle, and they didn't really have anywhere to, to, to hold on. They couldn't catch their breath anywhere. They're like, well, we haven't made the standard, so, so now what? And so what we've, what we've done is to, for the new phase is to just put in 
uh, three steps. And the first step is the registration. So if a protected area is interested, and as Sue mentioned, it's voluntary, so your interest is, uh, we're not going to come and assess your protected area for you. IUCN is not going to come and say, hey guys, you know, you don't make the green list. And they're like, what? We, well, we, we, we're not, we, have any, we don't know what it is. So it has to be uh, a registration, and that registration is almost the most important step, and that is a commitment to work towards a global standard for, for protected areas, in this case, marine protected areas. So that registration, it's accepted, the protected area is accepted, the basic data is submitted, they commit to the standard, and they begin to prepare the candidacy application. And that's the middle step. The candidacy is, is uh, it's, it's like the five out of ten. The candidacy is to demonstrate that you have all the ingredients necessary to become a successful protected area. So you have a, an inclusive governance process, uh, you, you, you're a legal protected area or, or equivalent, you have the boundaries are more or less defined, you know what your values are. It's, it's kind of the basic inputs that are prepared. And importantly, it's also the time where we identify who some of the stakeholders are. And so that the people who would need to be consulted or would need to potentially have an input to, to decide whether they believe that this area should be put forward on the green list or whether there's any issues of redress or uh, marginalization or, or other issues that might come up. So once accepted as a candidate, this is where uh, the real hard work begins of the, the expert group is to help uh, walk that protected area through the full standard and to see if at some point in the next few years from being a candidate, they can put the, all the things in place to be a greenest protected area. And that's where the focus is really on demonstrating the conservation impact. Um, and then they get recognized by IUCN and get all the promotion. And hopefully there's enough benefit in that, um, that that would still be worthwhile to, to strive for. Um, from the initial pilot phase one, the first protected area on our list was Adakwal National Park and uh, Cape Byron State Conservation Area in Australia. And the the handover ceremony when when they they met the standard the the value was really really tangible. There was a lot of emotion, a lot of tears. The staff there had worked hard. It really meant something. And and I'm hoping uh, and our studies and and um, uh, work so far has indicated that there is a strong uh, value proposition in protected areas for this. And we're hoping that over the next three years we can test that assumption further and including in more marine protected areas. This slide can be a little bit more of reference, but this I just wanted to link back to uh, our assurance process. And we're not developing this uh, in the dark. There is a lot of work already done on sustainability standards globally. And there is um, a group that uh, IUCN subscribes to, and with the Greenest, IUCN will hopefully be a member of. And it's called ICEAL, which is the International Sustainability, no, sorry, International Social and Environmental Accreditation and Labeling Alliance. And they have uh, a code of practice for developing sustainability standards, and they also have credibility principles, which hopefully you can see on the screen just above the dolphin, which is completely ignoring them and just swimming off like we usually do. But there's, uh, these principles are what we are holding the green list up to. We want it to be uh, absolutely uh, nailed to the ICL uh, process. Um, and in doing this, we're actually offering a new way of looking at things for a, what is essentially a non-market uh, accreditation kind of labeling uh, product that we have with the green list. Most protected areas, the majority of them are public, public goods, uh, state operated or community managed or else, you know, other, there isn't really the market such as, you know, FSC has, for example. We could have some market integration of this, but it's a kind of a different model. So it's also interesting from their, their perspective to see how we can develop something um, that adheres to the principles. Um, and you'll see on their improvement, uh, efficiency, sustainability, transparency, um, these are, you know, these, all these principles make sense, but making them actually happen is, uh, is, is our challenge and making them happen cost effectively is another thing that I'd hope that there'll be a couple of questions on as well, is how we, how we can have a good assurance but also keep the cost down and keep this within the grasp of, of any protected area worldwide, some with a little bit of support, but generally this should be an accessible and not top-heavy um, uh, scheme. Just a quick slide, one of the key lessons from our pilot phase is that this will not work on email, Excel spreadsheets and uh, seven versions of the same document floating around in, the, in an inbox. So we, we're really looking at the, 
uh, a custom management system. Uh, the likes of Salesforce we're in touch with. They have a foundation. Uh, hopefully they can provide some support. But we're looking to really have something where each jurisdiction, uh, each protected area can see themselves, can access this system, can track the progress, they can manage the content and the data. It enhances transparency because the date, you know, the current status is is there. Uh, we might, you know, look at some kind of stakeholder engagement platform as well. Uh, it can be in multiple languages with that core element of in in IUCN's language of English, French, and Spanish. And we're hoping that this would be operational uh, late, I said mid 2015, but late 2015. And this is key to this being successful. And if we design a uh, a green list for protected areas that is, you know, is only capable of handling a, a few every year. We, in a few jurisdictions, it's never going to go to scale. So we, we kind of need to have a vision for how we're going to manage all the data on this um, at scale. We're working closely with the WCMC, uh, World Conservation Monitoring Center, and the World Database on Protected Areas, make sure there's some integration, and with a few other uh, partners as well, just to make sure that we have good data and content management. So I'm nearly, I'm nearly there. Just wanted to put a schematic of the evaluation process. I hope it's come up on your screens. So the governance of the greenness is important and I'm going to come on to governance of the standard because that's something that everybody on this call can help with. Um, but overall we have IUCN owns the scheme. So it's IUC, it is the IUCN green list of protected areas. But within that, there's, uh, there's, there's some firewalls, there's some different roles for different groups and different people to be, to be involved. So at the top, we have an IUCN Global Green List Committee. And in the interim, we have a committee whose role was to really help think through what the committee should look like. And we're, we're starting to put in place a new committee structure from next month. Uh, the committee members would uh, work to, you know, they would forget their professional affiliations. They would work to a terms of reference and in their professional capacity of, of expertise and in helping, uh, helping, you know, further the aims of the green list. They would be appointed by our director general and they would be at the top of the decision making structure. Under them, there'd be a small secretariat and, and there'd be a management team, especially for this next development phase, a management team. But ultimately, we have this uh, um, uh, appointed but independent committee at the top. Uh, the role of the committee is to verify all the evaluations. So the buck stops with the committee. They have the final say on all the decision making. It doesn't mean they need to go through all the data, but they need to see that the checklist is being done, and they have the right at, at any point to, to raise a red flag or say, "Hey, I want to see more of that." They can dig back down deeper into the the chain. Everything would be transparent to see the data, and they can ask further questions. But essentially, if the technical evaluation is sound, that the independent review process says it's been assured then that decision making should be fairly quick to assign uh, the green list status uh, to protected areas. And we do that assigning probably uh, at the moment once a year. We'll do the next one in 2016, but we could see in the future that might be biannually or even quarterly. At the bottom, the, the smaller box is that local expert action group, the Eagles, as we call them. Uh, they're the ones who are doing the technical evaluation. They're, do, they're the engine of the green list. So, uh, successful nominations submitted via the review to the committee for approval and incomplete ones are referred, uh, clear guidance provided on the gaps and the shortfall. Um, and then we have around, wrapped around that this uh, accredited and independent review process, uh, giving feedback on the process and on compliance uh, with the assurance procedure. So that, that's kind of a, a simple, there's a lot of questions in there and we're still testing things, but that's essentially how we see it working. Change the slide. Change the slide. There we go. Uh, so the next, I mentioned 2016. That's not because we have a World Conservation Congress in Hawaii, who are also hopefully going to be part of this. That's 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 just a coincidence. But uh, given all the work we have to do to um, update the standard, to relaunch it, uh, and some of the the processes on the right there. We think it's probably realistic that our next listing, our next kind of uh, celebration of all the protected areas that have gone through the process would be in September 2016 and or in October, where there's a CBD event in Mexico, who I mentioned also partners. Um, and then for uh, 2017, uh, we'd then have an evaluation and kind of rejig and do it again. Now, the important piece on there is May to September and October at the top, 2015, and that is to launch our global standard for consultation. We want to launch it far and wide and over a period of three or four months 
uh, to get some excellent feedback. And that includes uh, the, the direction I'm, I'm trying to encourage is we have thematic groups that are really encouraging people around uh, different different aspects of the standard to provide uh, you know, kind of coordinated input. So I would hope that uh, this uh, WCPA Marine Working Group and any of you on this call could help uh, take a marine protected area perspective to our standard and to some elements of the process and to give that feedback over the next few months so we can then um, get that included um, and part of our uh, uh, governance structures we'd have a standards working group who would report to that committee and that standards working group would be uh, assigned uh, the task of, of revising the standard um, and we have some very standard people working on it uh, you know who do standards so they do standards every day so they're, they're um, hopefully going, you know we have enough um, time and enough uh, input and that we can really come up with something that's uh, that's going to, to really, really work. And we'll, we'll then test that in the next phase, and then it can be updated again the next time in 2017. Uh, so, in the interest of time, um, this is just from our pilot phase. We did have eight countries. Uh, we had 50 protected areas that kind of engaged with the process. 28 of those were nominated. 23 achieved the standard, uh, although it might be 24. There's one that's uh, tentative. Um, we had over 200 uh, people involved, mostly from those jurisdictions and then kind of our international uh, development team. And then from uh, the launch at the World Parks Congress in November, uh, nearly six months ago, we've had now 12 uh, firm commitments, new country proposals, and we're still working out now in the next couple of weeks which would be the new countries to come on board. So I mentioned uh, Micronesia, for example, uh, Japan, Vietnam, uh, there's some North African interest. We have uh, Central and South America, and then certainly within Africa, we're still working out where best to go. South Africa is Burkina Faso. Uh, there's a whole range of, uh, of countries um, in and around uh, Africa, and and then in Europe as well, we have France, Spain, and Italy forming a nice, uh, a nice block. They're collaborating, and uh, there's some marine protected areas that they're looking at, transboundary ones as well. Um, then there is a couple of smaller countries like China and Russia. Um, who are interested, and um, so hopefully in the next months we'll we'll narrow this down to about 20 jurisdictions that would be working in uh, in the next uh, the next certainly the next two years, and that could increase as well. So it's it's exciting. The demand is really tangible, um, and so we've just got to be careful we don't uh, outpace ourselves in terms of the resources. We're already stretched a little bit, but we're hoping that um, uh, we can really pull pull this together this year and uh, be able to service these places. Um, here's just a quick list um, of the successful protected areas so far. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Good. Uh, so the the outstanding um, marine protected areas in Colombia, there's Gorgona, uh, which is an island uh, in the Pacific. Uh, we have Guadeloupe uh, in France. Uh, Iroise, also in, uh, in Brittany and France. And then uh, Seber is spelled wrong there. Seber Banyuls, which is in the uh, Catalan corner of France in the Mediterranean. Um, and then in Australia, the, the both of the Araqual and Montague are, are managed uh, terrestrially, but they, they have marine components. Um, in China, there was one uh, marine protected area that was put forward, but didn't uh, didn't justify uh, meeting the standard yet. And that's Nanpeng Islands near near Shanghai, I believe. So we already have some experience with uh, with the marine protected areas. All of these are listed uh, provisionally based on our pilot process until uh, September 2016, when they'll have to justify why they remain on our updated standard. So if we change a few things, they have to then they won't have to do the whole application, but they have to justify how they continue to meet meet the standard. Some of the key things is around stakeholder input in our pilot process wasn't perhaps as tight as we had hoped. And so we'd have, um, you know, some some input from different people in these these, these protected areas to help us uh, uh, justify that they 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 remain on the list. So I'll um, we hand over to Sue just to put anything that I might have missed, and then we can um, have some some Q and A. 
Thanks very much, James. I, I think that was great. I haven't any. I don't want to sort of add anything specific, and we want to allow enough time for questions. I do just want to um, run through a few ways that people can can actually get involved. Um, I think the first thing really is to get a good understanding of the process um, before you launch into commenting on it. It, it is actually quite complex and um, every time I hear a presentation on it I think I must go back and really make sure I've, I've grasped that. So I would urge you if you're interested start by getting to grips with it all. Um, James can put you in touch with the main um, sources of information on the green list. Um, secondly, as has been mentioned, there are a number of specific jobs to be done, um, reviewing the global standard and as James mentioned, we'll do that through the working group rather so he's not inundated with individuals writing in. So if you, if you looked at it all um, once it's launched and have comments, do please get in touch and we will keep you all informed of how we're going to um, respond to the consultation. Um, if you're with, working with an MPA that you think um, might like to, to get involved in the process, um, look first at whether the, your country or sort of jurisdiction is already involved and if it is, go through them. If not, it's a little more difficult because as James says, they are getting a little bit inundated with um, uh, initiatives that want to, you know, that, that there's only a limited amount they'll be able to do in the second two years, but get in touch with us to see if, if there's something we can do. Before doing that, do look carefully at your MPA or your MPA system to see whether you think it is actually ready for that and look, look at how good the management is, look at the criteria and standards and what you have to achieve, look at what kind of cons whether you can sort of measure the conservation impact that you're having because you, you might feel you want to spend um, a couple of years really working on the management plan and uh, your management and your monitoring uh, before leaping into it. That might be a better, uh, a better way to go. Um, if by any chance you're involved with other related initiatives um, that are doing similar things um, but and you haven't been in touch with us, uh, do let us know. We're trying to pull together all the um, standard certification process. An example, we're already in touch with um, the Coral Reef Triangle, for example, because we know they have a process for, for listing uh, MPAs and we'll want to make sure that um, we link up carefully with that. Um, and if you generally have any suggestions um, as to how we should take this forward through MPAs, do get in touch with me and um, we'll discuss it in the group. And I just also wanted to say that Dan LaFoley is being very helpful with WCPA Marine in the various ways that we can keep you informed of the green list. There's the WCPA Marine Facebook site, the MPA blog, Lisa, Twitter. Uh, we'll use all those media for um, spreading information about the progress. So we'll use the working group to um, liaise with James and the IUCN program on this and make sure the information then goes out to the whole MPA community. So I think at this point we can perhaps uh, hand you over to Lauren and um, for the Q&A session. Okay, thank you both. That was really great. And um, so this is Lauren Wenzel at the MPA Center. I'm going to go ahead and facilitate some of the questions. So I encourage you, if you have any questions, please go ahead and send those in. I will go ahead and, and uh, some of them have already come in. So uh, there was a question about the availability of the recording and the slides, and those will be posted on the Open Channels website and also on the MPA Center website. So you can um, come back if you didn't get a chance to hear everything today and you will have an opportunity to hear the whole recording. So, um, and there was also a, I thought, a, a useful kind of clarification question from Lisa Duarte who, who just wanted to make sure she understood that the IUCN category assignment is a measure of management intent while the IUCN green list assignment is a, man a measurement of management effectiveness. Uh, would you say that's correct? Is there anything you would add to that? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, in terms of the category assignment, uh, I would say, yeah, that's right. That's uh, that's the intent. That doesn't necessarily um, help you with the, with the greenness, but that's something we encourage, and we'd look to have in the in the criteria and in the evidence that there is a management categories assigned. 
that would be one of the pieces. Um, the green list itself is not an assessment. The green list would look to a range of assessments. I mean, obviously, we'd like to see more of use of our, for example, uh, governance guidelines, management effectiveness guidelines, and so forth, and a lot of the MPA tools. But the green list would look in each jurisdiction to what is the best evidence available, what are the best tools out there that can help uh, a protected area to, to uh, demonstrate how it meets the standards. So it's not an assessment methodology in itself, but what it will do is um, is try to use the standard and, and garner the information from different methodologies and different different sources that are available to um, to see whether it meets the green list standard. Okay. And here's a question from Jennifer Beckensteiner who asks um, that a, a, an MPA will achieve the green list standard if it demonstrates conservation impact. So could one of those impacts be for fisheries management? And she's noting that MPAs are used more and more for fisheries management. <laughs> James, do you want to answer that one? Yes. Yeah, of course. That's that's a good question. If the uh, MPA is an MPA, one of the other things we want to to um, uh, just to make sure is that it meets the definition of being a marine protected area, and that's a whole different debate. Uh, it might be in the future that we, we could relax that a little bit and, and have you know different area-based conservation measures more generally. But if the if the area meets the definition of an MPA and sustainable fisheries management is a, a very important value that that MPA is there to enhance. Then you know the impact of having some 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 result around that particular value would be then uh, the important component for whether it meets the green list or not. Uh, James, I, w I wondered if I could just step in with an with another question. There, I mean, many MPAs have um, multiple values, multiple objectives um, for the green. Green listing. Presumably, the the process looks at all of the objectives and values. Uh, if you was were having an impact on one objective or, or value, but not achieving the others, would would you get green listed? I would imagine not necessarily. Not necessarily. We, we've looked at that and had some back and forwards. In uh, you know, we we want the protected areas to recognise all the values that they have. And to put appropriate management in place to to maintain those values. So ignoring one or two values in favor of the others um, wouldn't necessarily be um, you know favorable for the green list. But um, acknowledging that different values exist, but prioritizing you know certain ones and setting the management objectives towards them, that might be you know, how the protected area functions and what it's what it's there to do. So, um, but certainly knowing what the values are is is part of the initial kind of uh, candidacy. If you don't know what the values are, then, then obviously it's, uh, it's difficult to... to there, someone, someone is uh, typing while they're... Uh, I think it's maybe one of the speakers, so you could uh, mute yourself while you type. That would be great. Um, okay, we have another question here from Marcelo Milo who is asking, how are social values being measured and is it a standard methodology for marine and terrestrial? Um, that's a great question. I'm glad that that came up. That is, for me, the most important uh, piece of the green list overall. That we get the the social piece right. I mentioned that uh, governance is the the core the, the core pillar, and not just governance, but uh, equity in that governance. And again, not just as an input, but the the the, the governance outcomes are as important as a lot of the 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 natural outcomes, the natural values that are that are conserved. So uh, there are a number of um, uh, we're going to have an entire social working group, one of IUCN's commissions, um, and others who are interested to look at our standard to see how that can be tightened. I mean, what are the uh, what are the kind of underlying requirements? Um, for me, it's about uh, a greenness protected areas is one that you know suits the 21st century. That the 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 rights are addressed. That you know, it's a rights based approaches are included, um, and that we're not uh, looking to sweep things under the carpet where. Um, you know, there might be uh, social issues at stake. Uh, having an inclusive stakeholder approach as well to the listing, if we can, would help identify some of those and, and iron them out. Um, and I don't think anywhere is so broke. Some protected areas are, you know, are, are really um, uh, facing quite a few social issues, but I don't believe there's anywhere that can't be can't be corrected or, and uh, social issues can be better incorporated into the management uh, and the governance. So I'm hoping that the green list can also be um, a uh, a means by which there's more focus on the social aspects of protected areas. Not sure that was so coherent, but uh, um, your inputs and your thoughts as well on how we can do that would be welcome. 
All right. James Mortimer asks um, that the he notes the IUCN offers an online IUCN Red List training class. Will there be something similar for the Green List? Uh, yes, absolutely. That's uh, probably a component I skipped over in the in in the presentation. But yes, we really need to have really uh, excellent orientation materials available to those. Um, in all stages of the greenness process, particularly for those experts, uh, the action groups on how to how to work with the standard, how to work with the process, um, but also on others who might be interested, protected area managers, for example, like what is the greenness, how can you get involved? Um, and we're hoping that our, you know, as we go through the next phase, we can kind of really s settle in on certain procedures, and and then we can start developing the materials and the orientation around them. But you're absolutely, and that comes back down to having a really excellent web. Uh, web platform to build on. So we have a couple of questions asking about uh, interest in the green list from the United States, uh, whether sanctuaries might be appropriate for the green list, and, and whether you've heard any uh, expressions of interest from U.S. MPAs. Uh, Sue, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, I. I haven't directly. I mean, Lauren, can you talk to that? Do you, are you? I, I haven't directly heard anything from the U.S. Yeah, I, I, I'd be happy to chime in. I'm, I am curious about, just in general, not necessarily marine, but the level of interest you've had in the green list from protected areas in uh, in the U.S. and Canada. James, have you uh, have you heard much? Um, yes, I have on a, on a couple of counts, and uh, quite quite conflicting. I, uh, Hawaii is, of course, somewhere of interest because we're host. It, Hawaii is going to host our IUCN World Conservation Congress, another big meeting. But uh, you know, we, we seem to like these. But it's going to be in 2016, and so I've been engaging with uh, some different people in Hawaii, and the the feedback has been uh, various. That I mean, how can you start with Hawaii when you've got the whole of the U.S. and you've got all these different layers, and you know, who would agree, and how does it, how does it happen? From then. Uh, kind of more local lobbying groups are saying this could really be something if we can find one where we're all working and really promote it. It's voluntary, but you know if we could encourage uh, that, that local level to get a, a protected area working towards it. There's so much needs to be done in the marine protected area uh, situation in in Hawaii, for example, that you know has been raised. That could this be something combined with that event to really kind of give it a kick and to see if uh, something would move. Um, to, for Canada, the and this is interesting with Australia. Australia was part of our uh, pilot phase um, and really took to it with with gusto. And we have those two protected areas, and I'm really hoping we can continue with the jurisdiction there, New South Wales, possibly go the whole country. But a similar, you know, Canada. Um, I haven't had too much feedback, but the first first comment I had was like, well, why why do we need the green list? I mean, we know we're great, you know. What's uh what what, what value are you going to add? So yeah, we're, we're green list, but you know, we know we're great. So. I was like, yeah, okay. I can see, um, you know, this is this is a process. I think we have very different responses from different types of countries and and where they're at in terms of their protected area system and the investment they have in it. But I would see Canada as um, and the U.S. as potentially extremely interesting. And uh, I, I, but I wouldn't recommend biting off the whole country straight away. I think working at it maybe in one jurisdiction, or for one particular component such as marine protected areas, could be a great way to great way to go. And I'm saying from experience because we bit off China. We, when I put China, it's it's um, you know, it's uh, for a pilot phase, it was quite an undertaking. It's worked really well, but uh, we still have a lot of uh, uh, challenges with scale uh, and with the the institutional kind of uh, uh, um, panorama that China offers. And, and I'd imagine it's similar in the U.S. I appreciate your candor because I sort of wondered if that might be the reaction. Is uh, what what do we need this accreditation for when we already have our own way of evaluating? Um, I, I suspect that, that I could hear that from some protected area programs, but I expect others would be very receptive. And I guess my take on it for the U.S. would be that um, this process is very new, very unfamiliar to a lot of people. And so I think the first step is getting familiar with it, as Sue suggested, and understanding what it has to offer. And then exploring, you know, whether it makes sense for particular sites. And I, I note that, you know, at least Stellwagen Bank in the Northeast has has some interest in this. And I would also note part of that question had to do with MPA networks. And I'm wondering if there's any element of the green list that a addresses networks. Um, networks. Um, I mean, certainly. The current model is based on protected areas uh, nominations being put forward. And we already have 
uh, one case where it's a joint nomination, so you have two protected areas that are side by side. Um, I, I don't foresee a problem with a network, but it, each site would have to add up to meeting that standard as a whole. Um, I think the role of the networks is really in uh, uh, more in taking the network almost as a jurisdiction or, or across jurisdictions, mm -hmm. but finding the, the experts who are willing to take on the green list and provide that input to make it happen. And then as a network, you could then, you know, we could really benefit from, from a network approach to, to sharing some of the ideas and what works, what didn't work, and, you know, networking the protected areas that are, you know, part of our, our scheme. And, um, but we haven't deliberately looked at networks. That's something that uh, I'm just actually noting down uh, that we would need to, need to build in a little bit more deliberately. Okay, and here's a question from Alan White yes. asking. Oh, go ahead. So, sorry, it was just Sue. I just very quickly want to say, and this is why. Oh, I mean, one of the things we want to do with the WCPA Marine Group is document the experience of the MPAs that have taken part so far, because on, on two levels, one, one, this will show countries what is the value, what are the problems, and how they can be overcome and hopefully demonstrate to countries like Canada that there is a value to it, even for them, given that, uh, you know, European countries are involved. Um, and secondly, also, I think it's interesting where, in the case of France, we've got two MPAs that have already uh, gone ahead and achieved green listing. And so, in effect, they are part of the network. And I, as um, uh, James said, I think there is some value in having um, sort of networks of MPAs going through the process together, if that, if that works out, is feasible. Okay. Um, I was just going to ask another question that came in, asking for more information about how the Green List process will try to synergize with ongoing processes, especially in the regional scale, like Coral Triangle or the um, MPA framework in the Caribbean. James, do you want to answer that, that one that from, from the general point of view? Yeah, sure. Is that that from Alan? Well, firstly, yes. nice to nice to have you on the island. I miss I miss working out in the Coral Triangle region, and um, uh, thanks again for your your interest and support on this. Um, I would really like to see us working more on these regional uh, regional um, kind of initiatives because the 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 added value of having uh, the existing networks, the the comparison between approaches to protected areas at the system level and the site level. Um, is really valuable, and, and also the, in terms of the transaction cost of setting up the structures, uh, the assurance uh, and review, um, sharing the, the, the expert networks, uh, you know, the, the experience with using the green list, um, and then also using the kind of a peer-to-peer -peer and a bit of peer pressure as well between countries. So let's say in the Coral Triangle, the Philippines started to have quite a few on the green list and getting some good recognition that might hold up a good model and be something that Indonesia might respond to. or you know, it's certainly if we could put up Timor Leste and have a couple of theirs on there, it would be a real, you know, mean something. Uh, you know, unlike Canada, they they probably, you know, it might maybe not as well. Maybe it's just a distraction and not something they're ready for right now. But you know, I've been looking at um, uh, Amazon. I mentioned Amazonas uh, in in the, in the forest side, but Micronesia is a region with with the Micronesia challenge, uh, the jurisdictions that were part of that commitment. Um, that's an excellent model. I've been looking at some of the political ones as well, such as ASEAN. ASEAN has their, their heritage program. There was some interest from, from them as well. And certainly in the Caribbean, I think there's a lot of opportunities. As, you know, there's decades of, uh, of connections, collaborations, networks, and things there that would be you know, something that the Green List could, uh, could help uh, you know, raise the profile of some of these commitments as well and, and, and be useful for advancing some of the marine protected area work there. So I'm, I'm, all, I'm all up for it. But at the moment, we're, we're going on the jurisdictions, which are either from a state level uh, you know, such as New South Wales within Australia or Andalusia in Spain, up to then we're trying now to go on a, on a larger approach, such as looking at Micronesia as one jurisdiction. And, and Alan, I think through the working group we could explore some of these issues in, at the marine, uh, marine level, so we'll be in touch. So I have two other quick questions, hopefully we can squeeze in. I think this is a good one for the working group as well, asking, um, we know MPAs need a certain extent of no-take zones to provide natural values. Is there a reflection of no-take zones in the process of green list MPIs? James, I think you'll have to answer that because you know the details of the indicators and... and um... <laughs> well, I think, I think that's... Um... 
that's addressing some of the criteria, and they're in the bottom of the slide that I'll share, uh, just a summary of it. And I can share the the updated version 2.0 standard at the end of this month. That's one we're going to do for consulting. So definitely, when you when that comes out, have a look at how we're addressing that. But um, I don't want to, to to have a global standard that says you must have no take zones because in different contexts, in different places, for different values, for different purposes. It might not be the best the best approach, and there might be areas that uh, where no take is not um, necessarily you know this is something that should be mandated. I, I mean I, I I think it pretty much is. I don't know too many marine protected areas where it's completely uh, you know there isn't some element of at least temporal or otherwise. But it's really you know for the greenness to be that prescriptive, it would have to then be at the local jurisdiction level to look at the indicators and to look what is the what is the best. Um, uh, kind of standard how this can be adapted to the context, and then for each protected area, whether whether having a no take is actually essential to to maintaining the values that they're set out to protect. I'm not sure that was okay. clear. Yeah, no, I think that was that was helpful. I'm going yeah. to ask one last question, which has to do with an incentive to countries to participate in the green list process. Has there been any discussion with donors or partners about helping to fund work on gaps identified by the green list? Yes, yes, and it's it's early days. Um, in my introduction, you mentioned conservation finance. I've been really keen to see where we can get some blend of um, linking this to different donor programs, but also to some more market mechanisms as well, and you know the potential around uh, tourism and different uh, markets based on ecosystem services in and around protected areas um, to have some kind of um, using the, the the green list standard to to ensure that uh, investments in and around protected areas actually do achieve uh, results, they achieve impact, and then with some kind of uh, remuneration um, from our assurance process that's covered where there's markets, where there's the funds around it. Similarly, donors that are investing in protected areas or even conservation trust funds could use the the green list standard to measure the performance over time of their investments. Um, my idea would be to have uh, some facility to support countries and places that cannot otherwise easily access um, the resources to put together um, you know, a, a case for, for being part of the green list that we have that available as well. So we're, we're really looking at it. I, I, I think we've got to go beyond donor and kind of sponsor philanthropy. We've got to get into you know, what, what, what mechanisms exist by which we can begin to get some uh, using the green list standard as a way to Channel resources to those that you know you could really see uh, an improvement in performance. So any ideas welcome, but we're we we've got one part now. I'm hoping to have a working group on the greenest development phase, looking specifically at that. All right, all right. Well, I know we have to wrap up now. I wanted to thank James Hardcastle and Sue Wells very much for joining us today, and I also wanted to thank Sarah Carr and Nick Weiner, both at EBM Tools and at Open Channels for helping support this webinar series. Thank you all and hope to see you again. Thanks very Thanks much. Thanks everyone. Thank you.